tape back there. Oh, okay. We can hear you. We're trying to build the household of God, and we have a toolbox in wanting to do God's work. Uh, today I offer you, maybe it'll, it'll be a small screwdriver or some uh, intricate little tool that you might be able to use on occasion, but uh, if we're to be craftsmen in God's kingdom, then today I might offer you another tool in which to examine the, the word and in which to examine our lives and the ministry that our lives are to be about. The title that I gave Don, and that both he and I created were and I wanted to be very careful that I wasn't offensive in that, but I wanted us to look particularly at the term of submission as it uh, originally came to me in looking at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, one of the, the front burner issues that, that I've been studying about and trying to study through has been uh, men's and women's role. And out of that study came my confrontation with that term of, of submission. And it really spun out of that a, a much larger study of the term and why is it that we struggle so with a term of submission not just in the men's and women's role but within the church and and within the world and within the, our culture uh, whether we're spiritual or not we have a real problem with the term of submission and my contention is that in our culture we submit to very little if any thing I don't submit to the speed limit signs. My, my rule is I, I'll do five miles per hour over. That's my limit. But when I see 55, my mind says I'll do 60. Because I know from having been a police chaplain that most of the, most of the cops won't give you a ticket if you're doing five miles over. They know it probably won't uh, wash if it goes to court. And so we don't submit to a whole lot in our culture. I think we try to find loopholes. I think we try to get away with whatever we can get away with. And we don't submit, we subvert. And we'll, we'll look like we're going along with the, the guidelines as long as it's in our best interest. I want to share a little bit of, a, of an article that was in USA Today of uh, Wednesday this week. And it was by uh, Armstrong Williams, managing partner of a Washington public relations firm. And he was writing about Madonna in uh, reflecting on her book that came out this week and has sold millions and millions and millions of books. And what I really want to get to is the point of, of identity and task. If you, were, if you were taking notes and you wanted to, to know what this class was all about today. It's trying to look at the world and the text with the concept of identity and task. He writes, Williams, as an entertainer, Madonna is a huge success. That's what our world's looking for, which says a lot about empty values. So it's easy to see how the public got to be so empty-headed in judging what's worthwhile. And that's what we're always asking ourselves. What is worth while? That's worship. Fi you know, worship comes from, from the language of what is worthy. Praise comes from that term, uh, what is uh, of appraisal. We have our houses appraised. And out of that we have the term praise. And so we come to God as believing people and we say, God, you're worthwhile. You are of number one value. But we live in a world that has different ideas on what's worthwhile, i.e. Madonna and, and her cultic following. He continues, The material girl lives in a world of music, fashion, style, and sex. Lots and lots of sex. Her videos are so raunchy that MTV can't air them. It's interesting that MTV even, even has uh, a standard, a value system, a morality and MTV will air anything short of human sacrifice. That coming on the heels of what F. Lagarde shared with us, how we sacrifice each other. The synonym of material is superficial, which sums up her contrived persona. Other than wearing her underwear in public view and being able to carry a tune, she has little to recommend herself as an icon. 
yet her records sell because buyers don't know better. And I think if we're going to talk in terms of evangelism, I think we've got to realize what we've got to take to them is the book of reality and help them to know better, that there is something more worthy. As a youth worker, I was always faced with the challenge of self-image, self-esteem in the kids that I was working with. They were in the, the midst of identity formulation. And I contend that it doesn't stop when you graduate from high school. That now that I'm doing, quote, pulpit work, that I'm still dealing with people that are in the midst of identity formulation. And my contention is that the gospel is ultimate identity formulation. That we've become self. That we have sought an alternative identity. And the world's out there going crazy to be like Madonna. Or how many kids want to be like whoever? Be it Michael Jordan? You name it. We are hungry for identity. Why kids are so susceptible to peer pressure. And that in youth work, in raising kids, you always have to address peer pressure. Well, again, I contend that that does not stop at 12th grade in high school. That we dress, we follow careers, we act in society due to pressures of, of our peers whether we be 16 or 66. And I tell kids, teenagers, peer pressure, a lot of times as a cop-out, is just that, it's a cop-out. Because I've had kids that'll say, well, it's real hard for me to stand up for Jesus and for my faith. And I, re I identify, identity and identify means sameness, that I see the same in those kids' statements as in my own life. When I was 16 years old, I was pretty much ashamed of being a Christian because I didn't see how it related to life. And I wasn't sure that it was worthy. That's because I think I had understood task, but I hadn't understood identity. But kids will stand up for the Dallas Cowboys. They'll stand up for the Denver Broncos. They'll stand up for the Portland Trail Blazers. Even if the rest, in the, kids, the, rest, the rest of the kids in the room hoot and holler and put them down. And they will. They'll say, yes, Dallas Cowboys. And you know, all their friends are giving them the... And, put a, and that doesn't faze them. So I know that kids can stand up to peer pressure if they have the right sense of identity. Usually it's a kid who's come from Texas, who's been transplanted to another region due to the family having to be transferred, and there died in the wool. Cowboy fans. I'm an L.A. Dodger fan. I was born and raised in L.A. County. And I lived in Colorado, so I'm a Denver Bronco fan. And you can make as much fun of me as you want, and I'm not going to change. Would it be for us to praise God the same in our spiritual identity when we go out into the marketplace, into the community, into our neighborhoods, that our light would be allowed to shine and we wouldn't cover it up the way I was doing as a 16-year-old? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We've got to be able to teach our kids, but not only our kids, all of our folks, how to be proud of the gospel. And that's going to take identity. A lot of language in the adult church about commitment. Well, if we just had commitment, I think that's a lot of task emphasis without a lot of identity emphasis. I think that's the same thing as saying, kids, why can't you stand up for certain things, but you stand up for the Dallas Cowboys? You know, why, why can't you be more committed? 
you'll be committed to whatever it is that you identify with. You know why people like to watch bowling on TV? I don't like to watch bowling on TV. But it's very popular. You know why? Because a lot of people bowl. And when they see those professionals bowling, they can identify with those folks. A lot of people hate baseball. But if you've played baseball, and you under... What kind of pitch is the pitcher going to throw this time? You know, is the runner going to go if there's a sacrifice bunt, if there's less than two outs, and you get all caught... Because you played baseball or softball at some time, and you identify with it. I don't enjoy playing, uh, watching soccer because I never played it as a kid. I never identified. Look at Ephesians, out of which came in chapter 5, that verse, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. <clears throat> Submit to one another. I'm reading out of the New International Version. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, we say. And we go verses 22 to 33. And we remind the wives how they are to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And we don't change that. That's, that's there in the text, although the, the actual word submit is not in the text in verse 22, hupotasso is left out, that word for submit. It's in verse 21. It's assumed that in verse 22, it's like verse 21 is the headline. In verse 22, it goes, wives likewise then to husbands as Christ is the head of the church. So submit is there, the idea of submission. It does mean a, a voluntary, a willing giving up of your rights. It's, it's nothing that is controlled, ruled by some kind of power that is infused into the husband. But the direction is to the wives. Relinquish voluntarily rights so that you will be in submission to Christ as we are all giving up rights in relationship with each other. See, what Paul is really concerned here in writing to this church in Asia Minor is that they have unity, that they learn to get along with each other. Because they were starting to taste freedom and were starting to get out of control, and also because Paul wanted them to be a good model, a good example to the community around them. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians gives identity. Paul tells these Christians in the Lycus Valley up in there in Asia Minor, whether it be um, Ephesus or, or actually probably several churches in that area that this letter was going to, he's telling them who they are because of what God has done. They're the ones that are chosen. Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. I mean, Paul just sets the theme. You're chosen. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to us, especially if we look at it through Calvinistic eyes of predeterminism, of predestination. I don't think that's what Paul meant at all. He's saying you're very special. You're number one draft pick. You're a Shaquille O'Neal. You're not just picked on the 38th training camp. You're a number one draft pick. You were chosen. 
from the very beginning. The world wants to be number one, and God's already said, you are. You see, I begin to get identity out of that. I begin to realize God thinks I'm special. And when you think you're special, you can begin to do chapters 4, 5, and 6. Paul gets to the practical part. You see, the, the whole letter pivots there at, at chapter 4, verse 1, when Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He takes chapters 1, 2, and 3 and explains the calling. You're special. You're chosen. You're so special that the mystery of how the, the Jews and the Gentiles are going to come together in God's church. That's the mystery. Chapter 3, verse 6. You're so special. Now, because you're special, live a life that will bring credit and honor of identity. We were made God. We're designed to bring glory to the one who has given us our identity. Sin is when we say, God, I don't want your identity. I want my own identity. Now I want to try to do a little biblical overview of identity because if we just jump into Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 and the list of do's and don'ts, and isn't that the, the main objection from a lot of teenagers, from a lot of kids? What, what is Christianity? Oh, it's a bunch of do's and don'ts. If we have kids, if we have people that are saying in a world that drives by and they misidentify the church because, they, oh, those are the people that can't have any fun. Those are the people that have a list of do's and don'ts. We've not communicated the real message that we have new identity now. That's why we live a life of the ethics. Exodus chapter 3, the story of Moses. I was fascinated when I came across this in, in my study. And again, what I'm doing today is trying to offer you another tool to look at some of the biblical story through this grid work of identity and task. Make sure we understand what's the identity issue going on here, and then what is this person told to do? What am I told to do in living out my life? Chapter 3, Moses and the burning bush. Verse 4, Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. When the Lord saw from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, and now here God is going to do identity clarification. He's going to identify himself. I, verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. That identity is so awesome, so magnificent to see the, the person of God. Verse 7, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Now go down to verse 11. Moses' response, I think, is our response too often. But Moses said to God, and what's Moses' concern here? It's our concern. It was Eve and Adam, their concern, when they had this opportunity for the forbidden fruit. He says, verse 11, who am I? Moses is concerned about whose identity? His identity. He's, you know, he's going to be going to Egypt, facing the Pharaoh. Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And now God's response. Notice God doesn't answer Moses' direct question. He's not, he's not worried who Mo Moses is. That's not what's important in all of this matter. And God said, I will be with you. That's the identity question that's really important. Who is this God? 
And Rubel said it so well last night. It's not the power of the faith holder, but the one in whom we have faith that counts. Our little old congregations are pathetic and pitiful and spiritually at poverty level sometimes. But my God can do all things. He is a... The problem is, is when our congregations don't become the church of Christ, but become the church of us. That's when we're in real trouble. When we have identity confusion. Ezekiel, chapter 36. Just trying to get a biblical overview here. Picking and choosing. Uh, I, I just want to see, uh, show you a little bit of the biblical picture that this is a consistent concept. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 22. God is preparing to bring the Israelites back out of Babylonian captivity and, and restore them. And we are restoration people. That makes a lot of sense wanting to bring them back. And in verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. God does it for his name. Biblically, when we hear that term name, I think we, we ought to substitute in there in our That's the ultimate idea. Who are you? Hi, my name is... And you give your identity. And often with identity then comes task. Number one question in social circles. Hi, what's your name? What's your identity? And then what's the second question that follows quickly on the heels? What do you do? Identity and task. They go together. And sometimes they're almost inseparable. That makes, when they get confused, then, then we have a real problem. If we're calling ourselves Christians' identity and not living the task, then the world does get real confused as to, well, what does a Christian really do then? If you see a police officer and he or she has the identity of the badge and the gun, but they are robbing a bank, we get real confused because their identity is not matching up with their task. Mark chapter 8, to the gospel, Jesus suffered from, and what we will suffer from is misidentification. The people didn't understand the identity of Jesus. They thought he was a different type of Messiah than he ended up being. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philem. They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, and here's the correct identification. You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now with identity will come task, and Jesus will follow his identity clarification. Now he'll show what he's really about. He'll describe his task. Verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You see, Peter thinks that Jesus is confused now with his own identification. No, Jesus, you're supposed to be the political Messiah. You're supposed to run the Romans out of here and take over and reclaim the throne of David and bring us back to a glorious day. This racially exclusive, politically powerful Israel. But Jesus says this is the crux of the problem. This is sin, capital S, as we saw back in Genesis chapter 3, fall of man. Sin is when we put our identity in front of God's identity. 
verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. The identity of the suffering servant Messiah, few, really no one understood at that, at that time. Let's go to our local congregations when we talk about leadership. What is usually the confusion? It's that leaders are misidentified as to what a leader is all about. And we don't identify the right task and we end up setting up leaders as corporate board directors in the model of the world. And Jesus says, no, you've misidentified kingdom work. Identify with Jesus and become a suffering servant leader. What about the gospel response after Jesus had died? Acts chapter 2, what happens? It's identity followed by response or task or ethic. What happens? Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. This is the gospel to the Jews. He presents the gospel and what is he doing? He is re-clarifying the identity of who Jesus was. And then in Acts chapter 2 at 36. Here's real. Peter's talking to the Jews here. Be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter is saying, here's the right identification. This was Jesus. He was the Messiah. And now the people realize that they had mixed up their identities. And they go, oh no! They realize their mistake. Oh no, we had the wrong man. We, we sent to the gas chamber the wrong man. And we were looking for the Messiah for hundreds of years. We mis-ID'd him. It's hopeless, isn't it? And Peter says, now here's the response, the task. Now that you've identified the right Messiah, now repent and be baptized into what's the baptismal formula? Into his name? Into his identity. <clears throat> praise the name of Jesus. We're saying praise the identity and I want to be identified with, with his death and burial and resurrection. And out of that we go out and ha live the life that God wants us to because now we've come back to the Father back to his image and we're saying we want to be like you God we want to be like Jesus we're sorry about the Garden of Eden we're sorry for sin we left God and we tried to take on our own identity we tried to follow Madonna we tried to be like Michael Jordan we tried to be like Donald Trump we tried to be like you name it or just try to be like yourself independent from God Baptism brings us back to saying, I want to be like Jesus. And so Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, be imitators of Christ as I am. Philippians 2, have the same mind of Christ, the same attitude as Christ. Identify with him. Uh, we've been very flippant in our language. When we, when we have new Christians that place membership, and I don't like that term, place membership, we say, they've come to identify with us. I hope that we are identified with the right Lord, if they're going to identify with us. In Acts chapter 10, the, the, the message, the gospel message to the Gentiles. It's the same pattern. Peter speaking to Cornelius. Verse 42. Peter's been talking about Jesus' identification. He commanded us to preach to the people. This is Acts chapter 2. He is the one whom God will testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And then after identification is made, then Peter calls for response. God's spirit 
acts and then he says here's water can anyone prevent these folks from identifying and giving their lives so that they can become like Jesus in his death and burial and resurrection and life now back to Ephesians as we finish we can't read Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 without understanding chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 give us identity. We're chosen. We're special. We're God's people. Now, verses 4, 5, and 6 live as children of light. Encourage each other with encouraging language. Wives and husbands get along with each other. Children obey your parents. Slaves, masters, you get along. Why? Because of who you are now. Isn't that what we tell our children? Boys, I want you to share with each other because that's what we do in the Brown household. That's what we do here at the Brown's house because you're a Brown. Your name is Joel Brown, and your name is Mark Brown. And that's what we do here. You see, you have an identity. And because you have an identity that's been given to you, you didn't earn it, you didn't have to work for it. You were birthed into that identity, that identity, and get along with each other. And we don't steal here because you're a member of our family. And our family doesn't steal. And that's what Paul does he constantly reminds them of who they are and who they are is because of what God has done not because of anything in our culture it, it gets real insidious as to how we gain identity teenagers deal with what I call the four killer bees to get identity in our world you got to have one of those to have identity to have real you know, identity means importance self worth you got to be beautiful or smart or have a, uh, either a sexy or an apple. And it doesn't stop when you graduate from high school. Us adults, we just play a little more sophisticated games. Basically, in this culture, you are what you can purchase. That's your identity. You're put into different socioeconomic groupings, and that's your identity based on what you can achieve. I was sent a, a letter. I have an offer for a $3,000 credit, un, uh, credit on this American Express gold card. And it was amazing how this letter read like Ephesians. And, and as we, how out in our culture, we, uh, we are given false identity. Uh, dear Mr. Brown, about one month ago, I wrote to you with the good news. <laughs> or a theological parallel is right here. That your credit standing and personal achievements had qualified you for gold card membership. Yeah, that's good news. That's gospel, right? Financially, that's great news. I wrote to tell you that you were, in fact, still are among a select group. That's, that's chapter one. You're chosen aren't you and then it goes down and then with the gold card you'll be eligible for all kinds of the benefits which characterize this very special level of card members all praise to God in this case being the gold card because with this gold card if you identify oh you have a gold card you identify with a gold oh I see with this gold card you can do a whole bunch of stuff you'll be eligible for all kinds of the benefits and then it says because of this identity now it shows me the task for example the words right there for example Paul said therefore I urge you because of the calling you've received therefore where and when you want it boy the problem is you see what the world does is it, is it mixes in some truth with lies the ability to obtain cash where and when you want it. If that were only true. <laughs> Columbia College wouldn't have to ask for, you know, the deception is, but folks, you're going to have to pay for it. Yeah. 
buy now, pay later. This was just the other day, this service merchandise. Bill in February, pay in March. That's the world offering a false identity, saying, you can be something because you can possess this. You'll be something. You'll have identity. The world doesn't... The world talks to us Christians about being hypocritical and phony. Come on. The world's offering one thing and, and, and saying another. I was trying to, to think of some ways to, to finish... I just wanted to, to mention briefly the article that I found in the paper of two weeks ago. This is about the Measure 9 ballot in Oregon. Just a little bit of this article. This was a pro-gay um, rights article. Towards the close of the article, David Foster of the Associated Press out of Scappoose, Oregon, here wrote, uh, Public officials embarrassed at the erosion of Oregon's reputation. See, that's identity. Your reputation is your identity. Don't smear my name. Don't tear my name down. That's, that's who I am. That's my essence, my identity. Embarrassed at the erosion of Oregon's reputation as a progressive, tolerant state. And, and those are the qualities that, that this culture holds up high, progressive and tolerant, have lined up to denounce Measure 9. My question is, what is our reputation? We get identity, I think, from the text, and then we need to look at the text also to see what is our task. Uh, I hope this, this tool that I've offered you, another way to, to consider some of the texts, consider uh, biblically some of the theology as far as how God deals with us. He calls us to new identity, and then out of that identity, to live a life worthy of that most praiseworthy identity, to be like Jesus himself. Thank you very much. Uh, I would...